let us do a recap of last week's uh, sermon before we uh, dive into Deuteronomy 13. Okay, last week, Moses warned against idolatrous worship, but instructed joyful worship at the appointed place through Jesus alone as the true worship. So, last week, Moses in chapter 12 warned the children of Israel not to be trapped by idolatrous worship. I would like to reiterate that worship is 24-7. This one and a half hours that we gather over here is corporate worship. So we are reminded of who we are and what we have been called to. The end of this corporate worship is the beginning of the larger part of worship, where we go forth to live out our Christian lives, showing whether we serve the Lord or we serve ourselves. So in all that we do, say, or think, at home, workplace, or in the church, it is worship. Okay. So that was for last sermon. Today I've entitled the sermon, Warning. I guess most of us in a lifetime had received numerous warnings. It can vary in terms of importance. Some may be life-threatening, and some may result in dire consequences if we do not take heed. And most of us are familiar with the fire alarm system. When it is triggered, we know that it is a warning to evacuate the building because of fire. And failure to do so, or delay in a response, may result in death. And one notable example is the Grenfell uh, is a fire at the Grenfell Tower in London in June 2017. The fire broke out in the residential tower block, resulting in 72 deaths and over 70 injuries. Investigations revealed various factors contributing to the severity of the disaster, including the failure of the building's fire safety measures and residents' confusion and delay in response to the fire alarms. Perhaps a picture will tell it all. And in today's passage, warnings were given to the children of Israel regarding various scenarios where one can be led astray to go and serve other gods. Did the children of Israel heed the warning? No. The Israelites did follow false prophets and did not obey the instructions that were given to push them out of their community and therefore allow themselves to be contaminated with the devil's lies. Uh, why do you think Moses tell the people to kill those false prophets who led them astray to turn away from Yahweh? Some of us may say, so serious, man. So why so harsh a treatment as to kill the false prophet? Because it is dangerous to follow the false prophets and the consequences were dire. If, if only they could see what was coming for them during the exile, they will surely appreciate God's instruction to kill the false prophets who led them astray. And it shows how important and grave the matter is to God. It's the consequences are that they suffered the discipline of God during the Babylonian and the Assyrian exile. And yet, even now, as we are here, there are myriad of false teachers lingering out there and preying on gullible believers and enticing them to serve other gods rather than the one and only true God. Why so many people can be fooled? Scripture has already informed us on the dangers of following false prophets and the consequences of it. So let us dive into chapter 13 and hopefully we will not be like the children of Israel that were duped. But first, let us pray. Thank you, Father, for your holy word. And as we open your word, we pray that your Holy Spirit will be our truth teacher. We pray that you will open our hearts and minds, that your truth may reside in us, so that we can live a life that will shine for you. And now we pray that the meditation of our hearts and the words from your unworthy servant's lips will be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Now, by the way, this is a hard passage. It is not so hard because it is difficult to understand. In fact, it is very simple and straightforward, but difficult to accept this teaching. I will el elaborate as we go along the way. Okay, so I have my first division is simply entitled as, I'm sorry, warning uh, one against false prophets. So Moses basically listed three areas of influence where believers could be enticed to go and serve other gods. These warnings are basically God's provision and protection for Israel. First, it is the prophet or dreamer of dreams. If that prophet is able to perform the sign and wonder that he claims he can, but tells the Israelite to go and serve other gods, do not listen to him. Why? Because this is a violation of the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. Now, the usual response when we see supernatural acts is confusion. You know, it is so real and what to make of it. Now, as a young boy, I saw the medium piercing the sword into the mouth and taking it out with no injury at all. And he spun for about a minute in the air and it was fast and furious. So what to make of it? I asked the question, how, huh? Where did he get his powers to do this? Is this from God or the devil? It sowed doubts into my mind. But this passage tells us clearly not to believe in the prophet, even if he can perform signs and wonders, but did not speak in accordance with the word of God. Now, of course, during that time, I had not read this passage on Deuteronomy 13. And we have many New Testament verses to substantiate that. Now, here is one. In Matthew 24, 24, it says, For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. So not every supernatural act is from the God of the Bible. It could be attributed to illusions or the work of the devil. Remember, Pharaoh's magicians were also able to turn the staff into sticks. Wait, uh, sorry, to turn the staff into snakes uh, too when Moses did that. And signs and wonders are not the basis for truth. It is only God's word that can validate truth. Signs and wonders are very appealing to the flesh and we are creatures of curiosity and will be attracted to this kind of phenomena. We are supposing to walk by faith and not by sight. But more often than not, many falls into believing false prophets, as shown by the children of Israel, and now even in our present day. Why? This is because they find the signs and wonders to be more credible than the truth of God's word. So the first implication that I have is not every supernatural act is from God. We should not believe and follow someone just because they perform a miracle. You see? Simple as that. Not every supernatural act is from God. We should not believe and follow someone just because they perform a miracle. Now, another reason for the presence of prophets, of the false prophets as given by Moses, is to test the Israelites whether they love God supremely. Yeah, I understand this is one of the questions that you all discussed during your IDG and couldn't come to a, a conclusion. <laughs> Why is God allowing this uh, you know, presence of the false prophets to be a test? So you may ask, why God like that? Since he knows that this may result in the unfaithfulness of his people. But testing provides opportunities for success or failure. Our faith will be strengthened when we pass the test. as it also provides opportunity to grow. Is it not true that test is a constant in our life? We face many tests in our life. In fact, every day is a test of choices we make with circumstances we encounter. For example, at work, when the situation gets difficult, we may choose to falsify the report so that we may not lose the job. However, we can choose to remain truthful 
and report it as it is and face the music and even lose the job. So this test will reveal to us our heart condition and whether we love the Lord or we love ourselves. Similarly, the Israelites will come to know themselves whether they love their God supremely. So by the way, tests are actually meant for us, okay, and not for God. God is omniscient and he already knows the outcome. It is actually meant for us to find out who we truly love. So the next implication that I have is testing from the Lord is to reveal our heart condition, who we truly love. Okay, testing from the Lord is to reveal our heart condition, who we truly love. Now the instruction towards the false prophet is to kill him. And the reason given is that he has taught the children of Israel to rebel against the God who had delivered them from slavery in Egypt. And this evil must be purged from their midst or else it will spread out like yeast from the dough. Okay, it is like gangrene. If you do not amputate the leg, you will have your whole body infected and worse still, you may even die. Would you take the risk and say that you do not mind to die and not want to amputate? Or will you rather live on without a leg? Now at first sight, this instruction may seem harsh. Now you look at countries where there is no death penalty or no death sentence for drug pushers with those who has. Now what happens if you do not have any uh, death sentence? You will see the drugs being peddled on the streets and drug addicts all over. And if your children are one of those addicts, what will you say? Will you say, oh, don't be so harsh. Let us sympathize with the drug trafficker. Okay? He has to feed his family. No, right. We are not going to say that. We will surely say, sentence them to death. Immediately we will do that. Because it affects our loved ones. So similarly here, it is to decide whether you will kill the prophet who misleads you or allow him to lead everyone else astray to serve other gods, which would result in thousands of people losing their soul for eternity. So at first sight, this instruction may appear harsh, but they are actually merciful. It is God's provision to protect Israel from falling into apostasy. Okay, so we've come to the next uh, division, uh, Warning two, and that is against loved ones. These are the people that can entice us to go and serve other gods. So the second area of influence that can entice the Israelites to serve other gods is the family and close friends. This may happen secretly in the quiet of the home. This is hard to swallow, as we may think that family members and close friends will do no harm to us. But someone in the family may find Okay, this is during the uh, children of Israel's time. Uh, just imagine that, that, that the pagan neighbor's faith is more attractive and rewarding as they seem to reap a full harvest as compared to themselves. So he may, find, he may then find out which God their neighbor was worshipping and entice his family members to do so. So such enticement can be deadly because they come from people we trust and our gut is more likely to be down. So Ahab, Solomon and Samson are a few examples of those people who were led into sin by those closest to them. Job was also tempted by his wife, but stood strong. Now, we cannot choose our parents or siblings, but we can choose our spouse and friends. Having godly spouse and friend is crucial, as they will not be the source of temptation to let us go to serve other gods. Instead, they will help us to, uh, in our walk with the Lord. They will pick us up when we stumble, unlike an, an ungodly spouse who will be a drag on your spiritual life and a constant source of temptation. So the next implication that I have is it is very crucial that believers surround themselves with godly companions. It's very crucial that believers surround themselves with godly companions. The instruction for fam family and friends who lead others within the family astray, is, who, sorry, who lead others within the family astray is to stone them to death, and the one being enticed must throw the first stone followed by the rest of the people. They were even told 
put to pity and spare them. See, this is nerve-wracking, right? But this is also to be a deterrent so that all Israel may hear and fear to commit this sin again. This stoning was meant to be visual, brutal, and memorable, so that it is a sin never to be committed again. But now, I'm sure in our midst, there will be some of us who will think to themselves, what kind of God will do that to instruct someone to kill their family members? It's crazy, right? Now, you can approach this matter from two angles. The first angle is to conclude that God is harsh and does not know what he is doing. And this comes with an attitude that places myself on the same level with God and think my thoughts are the same as God's thoughts. The other angle is acknowledging that he is God and I am not. Okay? In my younger days, when I see passages like that, I was lazy to find out more about it, but would tell myself that God is surely right, even when it makes no sense to the human mind. So I knew that there was surely a valid reason for God to give a certain instructions, and it is just that I'm too lazy to find out and I do not understand. So, but in this case, God is merciful and provides a solution to stop the spreading of apostasy to the entire family. Now, in verse 10, in verse 10, Moses reminded the person needing to carry out the stoning that this is the God that brought you out of Egypt and slavery. It is as though Moses knew, Moses knew that people would rebut when this instruction was given. Now, someone may say, how could anyone do this to their family? Your brother is the son of your mother. Your wife is the wife of your bosom. And your friend is as your own soul. And Moses' reply would be, but this is the one who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. He is God. Moses wants us to think, how can anyone do this to their God? Your God is the one who redeems you. And in case, in case we think that the God of the Old Testament is very radical, then let us look at what Jesus said in Luke 14.26. Uh, in Luke 14.26, it says, ah, let us read together. <laughs> Just let us read together. Huh? If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Yeah, so this comes from the very mouth of Jesus. So when we are torn between the devil and the deep blue sea, the choice that we make will reveal whether we are truly his or otherwise. Jesus is not saying do not love your parents, but he's saying that when it comes to the crux of the moment, whether to obey God or parents, we must make the decision which is God honoring. What would happen if nothing is done to the influencer? It will give away to idolatry and would result in many lost souls. Historically, idolatry had caused Israel to be conquered many times by foreign powers as a discipline from God. Against them, turning to other gods. Okay, so the next uh, implication that I have simply is God is gracious and merciful to provide a way out to stop the spreading of idolatry. And he is worthy of honor all the time. And the next uh, division is warning number three against entire community. Against entire community. The third area of influence can be from a group of worthless people in one of their cities, which God was going to give to them. Moses told them that if they hear that these worthless people, or otherwise some version says evil people, had influenced some of the citizens to go and serve other gods, they shall make a thorough investigation. Of course, we should not act upon rumors, neither should we sit back and do nothing. The tendency is to turn a blind eye and to lift the situation on its own and to justify that we are not in the position to do anything. So the concern is to protect the nation as a whole against those who would lead them into idolatry. So the next implication that I have is simply it is our duty to act. It is our duty to act when we hear the potential danger 
of fellow believers falling into idolatry. Moses then instructed that if the investigation is true, they shall devote the city with the worthless men and their cattle to destruction by the sword, because it is an abomination to the Lord. If nothing is done, it may spread from city to city. So this is the same for public sin, which is allowed to go unchecked in the church today. It is like yeast, which will affect, which affects the whole lump of dough. Furthermore, the spoil is to be gathered into the open square. This then was to be offered to God as a burnt offering by burning the spoil along with the city. And the city is not to be rebuilt and it should remain as a heap. And this is to serve also as a deterrent for others to see. Now in verse 17, God shows how meticulous he is by stating that no one is supposed to take any of the devoted things. This is to prevent anyone of doing this for their own gain and agenda. Otherwise, we will witness many accusations against others whenever someone wants to profit from this exercise. So if the Israelites obey, the Lord will continue to be merciful and compassionate to them and multiply them as he had promised to their forefathers. Now this segment basically shows us that we should treasure our bonds with God greater than ethnic or national bonds. Okay, those who fell into idolatry were not to be spared. So the implication that I have is we should treasure our relationship with God more than anything else. Yeah, I would have entitled the sermon, Kill, Kill, Kill. Because in all three cases, you have to kill. And someone may say that you'll be convicted of murder if you do that. Of course, we cannot kill. But the principles of the passage still apply. So how can we relate the passage to our present day context? Now, some, of our, some are oblivious and may think, are there false prophets out there? Is the Bible blowing it out of proportion? I'm afraid that false prophets are an ever-present reality and they were always there and will be there till the Lord's return. Now, some churches seek for special gifts of visions and dreams. And if you try to show them what the Bible says, they will say, I know the Bible says this, but I experienced this. So in other words, they are putting their experience above the word of God. So in all this, we must ask the question, what did Paul say in Galatians chapter 1, verses 8? But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. Or some versions you will see the word anathema, which is the same as accursed. Okay? So is the Bible the true source of authority? No. They all do not preach the sole allegiance of worship to Jesus Christ, but add on to the teachings of the Bible. They use the Bible and they have additional books to abide by. But the, the more subtle ones, the more dangerous ones, are the false teachers from the health and wealth gospel. They use all the Christian jargon and terminologies like us. They will speak uh, words like Jesus, grace, mercy, and love. So they subscribe to certain doctrines like we do. For example, the doctrine of substitution. Okay, 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he had made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So this is saying, I think most of us understand that, that all our sins have been placed on the righteous Lord Jesus and is now carrying our sins. Now, he is a sinner, although he never sinned at all, that is Jesus, and all we who are downright sinners are declared righteous. So the doctrine of imputation or sub substitution. So, yeah, this is easy to believe, okay? This is easy to believe because there is no commitment on the part of the believer, okay? They, they, they have this uh, doctrine also. But when it comes to denying self and to take up the cross, they will conveniently just reject it, saying that it was, or, or rather saying that this was pre-cross, pre-cross, before the cross. So they say that this was meant for the Jews only, Okay? They say that this was meant for the Jews only and after his death and resurrection, this command does not apply because Jesus said it is finished. 
it is finished. It means there's nothing for us. Why should we go through the cross again when Jesus had already gone through the cross? Okay? So prosperity gospel has no theology on suffering and the sovereignty of God. So what is the problem with the prosperity gospel? It turns you away from serving the Lord Jesus and moves you to worship the fortune God. Okay, it points people to worship the gifts rather than the giver. There is no fortune religion. It is the devil's lie to entice humankind to embrace prosperity and longevity. True prophets since Old Testament time always point people to the truth of God. And they speak not for their own agenda or profit, but on helping the needy, seeking justice for the oppressed. And their words are consistent with the truth of God's word. Okay, they teach sound doctrine that is in line with what the Bible says. And most of the present day false teachers are self-seeking. Closer to home, we hear of pastors paid with a princely sum. They are usually eloquent and have great charisma to attract the crowds. And they say what people want and like to hear. So we have to be discerning. As first, or rather 1 John 4 1 wants us. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So the only way the bank teller is able to differentiate a genuine note from a counterfeit one is to know what a true one feels like. Likewise, the, the true, likewise, sorry, the way a follower of Jesus Christ can tell a false prophet from a true one is to know what God says in his word. And to know whether the prophet is consistent in saying what God says. So this is one way to equip ourselves against false teachers. Now what happens? What happens if one day a false prophet comes into TCEPC? Will history repeat itself again? Like in the past as in other churches? There will be an upheaval in the church because there will be divided opinions on the false teacher. Some will be attracted to the false teacher and before you know it, there will be division and strife in the church. There will be two camps, and the church eventually split. This will not happen if we are equipped and discerning to know what is true and false. What can deceive us to follow false teachers? It is the lack of understanding of the truth. And knowing the truth is one thing, but you also need to love the truth. You are accountable for your own understanding of the truth. And we deserve to be deceived if we are not discerning. We need to be equipped with the word of God not to be deceived. So what do we do with the false teacher? We need to exercise church discipline. Okay? And ultimately, excommunication if the false teacher does not repent. In the church, those who are more discerning okay, and equipped should be looking out for those who are more gullible and point them to the word of God to identify those false teachers. Now, the subject of false teachers is a prominent theme in the New Testament. Do you not know that 26 of the 27 books in the New Testament warns about false teaching and false teachers? So this will inform you of how important the subject is to God. So as an application, you know, uh, basically is how can we prevent ourselves from being led astray by false teachers. Okay? From the passage, it says that we must be ruthless against false teaching. But before even being ruthless, we must be able to identify whether it is false teaching, lest we'll be accusing people wrongly. So people are fooled basically because of Bible illiteracy. So as an application, the first, number one, be biblically literate. We read the word of God. And if not sure, ask those who understand better to help us. This is wise and what you would term as seeking for godly counsel. You know, love the word and it will free you from idolatry. Be a Berean. Some of you may know that. <laughs> be a Berean. Okay? Now, would you leave Something so important, okay, this is hypothetical, okay? 
like your bank book, I know these days we have no bank book, everything has gone digital, to someone else. You do not look at it at all, but just leave it to your friend to tell you what the balance is. No rights. You will monitor it closely. So if we were to treat the word of God so preciously as we treat our bank book, we will do much to gain the gem of truth that is in it. But more often than not, we just leave the word of God and go for other treasures. Would you leave something so precious to Pastor Ong Chi Hong and say, surely everything he says will be okay lah. What if one of these days he turns heretic and teach something funny? Uh, for example, you know, his favorite is, uh, only the handsome can inherit the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> okay, yeah, but if salvation is the most important thing in your life, will you just leave it to the hands of others to manage? Each of us is accountable for our own destiny. We cannot face God and say that Pastor Ong Chi Hong told me this or told me that. Okay, Pastor Chi Hong will be accountable to God okay, for what he teaches. But we are responsible to find out what he says is true or not. So read about the Bereans. What did they do in Acts 17? They will check through Old Testament scripture and use it as the master to check whether what Paul said is correct. Now, if Paul needs to be checked, how much more for other preachers? Okay, next, uh, the next thing we can do is be totally loving God. Be totally loving God. Verse 4, uh, as I flesh, can also mean what it is to love the Lord with all your heart, mind, and soul. Okay? Verse 4 is an expansion of what it is to love the Lord with all your heart, mind, and soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice and you shall serve him and hold fast to him. And in fact, if we obey verse 4, we will surely be able to resist false teachers and their false teachings. No, because, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, this is what will prevent us from falling into the sin of idolatry, the mother of all sins. Is it not true? When you sin, you push God aside and your sin replaces God. Is that not idolatry? As we said that anything that replaces God is idolatry. So prevention is better than cure. We believe in that and God through Moses provided the way out for falling into idolatry. And what does it look like if we follow the commands of verse 4? This is total commitment, total allegiance, total obedience, total devotion and dedication unto the Lord. If you live like that, you will never fall into idolatry. Okay? This is a lifelong exercise to practice and it will take time and discipline to achieve. We must love God enough to be walking after Him, fearing and keeping His commandments, obeying, serving and holding fast to Him. This is loving God. It is an action word and not an emotion or feelings. This is the antidote for not falling into idolatry. That's the answer for question three. <laughs> okay, and the next, number four. Be, to be grounded in the community to God. Be grounded in the community to God. We must be grounded in community. We must be looking out for one another. Those who are stronger in faith must be helping those who are weak. Remember that we are family by God's divine arrangement. And the next, of course, we need to be praying all the time because you do not know when it is coming. Because we may say that, oh, so far we have never or really faced any serious issues on false teaching, but you never know when it comes. So pray for humility for those who are weak to be willing to be taught. If someone approach you, be humble to sit through the entire passage and listen to reasoning. And pray for those who are stronger also to be patient towards those they teach. Sometimes good counsel will be rejected. It's always been the case. Then the best is done and we have 
to leave it to God. Pray for each of us also to be discerning and alert too, because the devil is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Yeah. So in the end, I must say this. If you and I are loving the Lord with all our heart, mind and soul, we will not fall into the hands of false teachers. So can you see the connection? Loving God means we are studying His Word, obeying His voice, fearing Him, and only concern to do what pleases Him and not offend Him. <coughs> Excuse me. We are also holding fast to Him. This pic picture paints it all. If we are holding on to God, like that man holding on to the rock, like it is only the life, only lifeline, like it is the only thing he can depend on, we will be surely under his wings of protection. Okay, so the summary that I have, uh, Moses warned the Israelites of what can influence them to idolatry and its treatment. 14 words. <laughs> Cannot be 10. <laughs> okay, so next, uh, let us uh, reflect for a minute or two. So today, if we are exposed to a false teacher, will we stand or fall? And what must we do if we are not ready for this test? Let, let us uh, reflect for a minute or two, and then I will close in prayer. Let us pray. Father, we, we thank you for your word that is always reminding us to be alert and not to go astray to serve other gods. Help us, Lord, to be wise, to equip ourselves with the knowledge of your word, that we can discern between true and false teaching, so that we will not be duped by false teachers and fall in our day of testing. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>